Last year, I decided that I wanted to grow some tomato plants, but I wanted to start these tomato plants a little before the normal season, and I didn't want them to freeze, so I decided to start them indoors. So to do that, to grow something indoors, you need a few things. You gotta water it, but you also need a source of light. So I went online to order me some light bulbs, some grow lights, so that I could start these tomato plants inside my house and then eventually move them out in the summer. Well, when I went to order these, there were lots of grow light options. There were some normal white lights, but I kept seeing over and over grow lights that were red and blue, that kind of looked pinkish. And I thought to myself, hmm, okay, I'm a scientist, I can figure this out. Yeah, I know that red and blue light is what plants really like for photosynthesis. So I wonder, will this be good enough? Can I just get these red and blue lights or do I need to get the actual white light like normal? So I thought, you know what? I'm gonna science this and I got both. So I set up a little experiment. I had some growing under the red and blue light. I had some growing under the white light. What I really was doing here was scientific inquiry. I decided that I wanted to do a test to see which light indoors grew my tomato plants the best. How did it turn out? Well, let's see as we investigate some scientific inquiry in biology. Let's get started. To engage in science, most scientists follow some rough version of a scientific method. So we always start with an observation. That was me when I was wondering, hmm, I see that there's some different colors lights. I want to grow my tomatoes. So I observed some things. I immediately had a question, right? I wanted to discover then what light is really going to be best for my tomato plants. So. Of course, before I did this, I, I did a little research. Can, do these tomato plants, will they grow with just the red and blue light? Or do I really need to get a white light that's gonna show more of the wavelengths, that's gonna have more wavelengths and a little more of the spectrum. So you do some research, right? So we had our question, we do some research, then we come up with a hypothesis. Um, in the next slide, I'm really gonna go over in depth how we can come up with these hypotheses. I'm gonna define my variables. Right? So what am I changing? Oh, well, I'm gonna change the color of light. What am I gonna measure? Oh, the plant height. So I'm going to define my variables. Then, of course, I gotta run the test. I gotta set these plants up in my greenhouse and I gotta see, do the test. So then I'll collect the data, analyze the data and really determine if there's any statistical significance, right? Nice charts and graphs so I can really see based on more than just an assumption or my initial observations, did, did these lights have any impact? And then finally draw a conclusion and communicate. That's what I'm doing here. I'm gonna to communicate to you some findings. You draw your conclusions. So there's no single scientific method, but this is a general idea, general scheme or method of how scientists would go about doing their work. And this is one of the reasons science, as I say, science is the best, science is awesome, because we have these methods for discovery, right? And once we find some conclusions, if we find out, oh, I need more data, we go back and that's why this is circular. That's why science relies on all of these tools to help us investigate the world around us. So I mentioned that I would talk about these hypotheses. How would we formulate a hypothesis? So again, remember my setup? I decided to get um, a normal white light uh, and then some red and blue, which kind of looks pink to grow my tomatoes. So we got my tomatoes. And then of course you turn them on, get the lights going. We're gonna see what grows. But what's my hypothesis? How would I formally state this? An easy frame is to set up this basic outline. If, then, because. Now, scientists working in the field will not always have this exact model. But if you're trying to learn how to do this, I think this is a good model to start. So we say if, then, because. Let me give you an example. So with my tomato plants. If tomato plants are grown with white and red-blue light, 
Then, now here's where you're going to make your prediction. Then the tomato plants in white light will have the greatest increase in stem length. All right, so I've narrowed it down, and I'm saying I'm just going to measure the stem length here. Then you need to give a reason. Well, I think this is because white light contains more wavelengths of light available for photosynthesis so that the plants will grow. Okay, so I've come up with a hypothesis. This is based in most part on the research that I did, right? And I've got a pretty basic structure here. If these plants are grown with these lights, then this one will have the greatest increase because the light that is white contains more wavelengths. So that's a, that's a solid hypothesis, if, then, because. Now, later on, you'll have to do some statistical analysis. And the statisticians always want us to state something which is called a null hypothesis. All right, so this might just be sort of your general hypothesis for your for your experiment But a null hypothesis is really going to help us later on when we start to do some stats What is a null hypothesis? Well a null hypothesis is basically saying that we're going to assume That there's going to be no difference in these two things, right? As scientists, we kind of got to go in we got to get rid of our bias we got to just go in assuming that there will be no statistical difference between this one and this one, right? So any good null hypothesis is going to start with, there's no significant difference in the growth between this and this. So I've, I've sort of formula, uh, put the formula here for it. In this example, the light color used will have no statistically significant impact on the tomato plant height. Why do we need that? Well, later on, we're going to decide statistically, will we accept this null? Or will we fail to accept it? Or will we reject the null? Or fail to reject, depending on the language you want to use. So the null hypothesis is basically just us saying, there's going to be no statistically significant difference between these two groups. Okay? So that is um, a good overview there for you of how to form a hypothesis. We then want to get a little bit more into the design, okay? You'll notice a few things, right? Notice that in my design here, everything's the same except one thing. Here we're using this light, here we're using the white light. We would call this sort of original experiment that doesn't have the change in color, we're going to call this our control group, right? This is the group where everything's the same as this, but we didn't change the variable. So this is the most like natural sunlight, this white light. So this is going to be my control group. Then the experimental group is the one we experimented on. All right, these tomatoes, we're using a different light, so or a different light color. We're using the red and blue light. And so this, we can also call the treatment group. We applied the treatment, in this case, the light color change, to this group. So a good experimental design is going to have a control and an experimental group. Well then, keeping along this idea of good experimental design, we want to talk about variables. So here's some data that I got. Now, if you look here, if we had 12 plants that were in the white light and we had 12 plants that were in the red and blue light, notice something interesting. Notice that for the most part, they grew about the same height, 10 centimeters here, 10.6 average here. But you'll notice we had one that was 22 here, one that was one. There's a lot more variance in this group, right? So if you look at the standard deviation, this had a very low standard deviation. There was not a lot of deviation from the average of 10.3. Here there was a much bigger deviation from the average. So. Let's use this to define our variables. What was the thing that I controlled? We would call that the independent variable. That's manipulated by the researcher. Well, what did I control? I changed and manipulated the color, right? White light versus red, blue light. So my independent variable in this case would be the light color. Now then, the dependent variable 
depends on that, right? Depends on the independent variable and we measure it. So in this case, my dependent variable, of course, is going to be the stem height in centimeters because the height depended on the light color. Then I wanna be really specific here. There are things called controlled variables. Now I'm not talking about the experimental control, right? Just using the white light, that was our control. But variables that we keep constant or control. Some people might call these the constant variables. What are your constants? So we watered them the same amount, right? That's a controlled variable. We left the light on for the same time. We had them in the same location in the room. It was the same temperature. All of those are variables we control. So good experiments will control for these constants or variables. So then I graphed it. Okay, so notice, okay, the red and blue light, about the same average, although there was quite a bit more statistical difference in the standard deviation. So now look at my graph. What are some things that make a good graph? One, I've labeled the axes. I've got the height here, I've got the color here. I've given it a good title. I've included some things here called error bars. And to learn more about the stats and how to do these graphs, I've got lots of videos on how to do all this in Excel and how to, how to deal with um, statistics and error bars. So you can watch those later. But for this video, I just wanna go over the basics of good science. And so here we've got some, I've got a bar graph with my different colors of light. I've got all, everything labeled. So where does the independent variable go and where does the dependent variable go? As you can see, I've put the independent variable down here. This is the thing that I manipulated, the light color. Okay, I've got the blue and red and the white light. So that means over here on the y-axis is the dependent variable. The height depended on the light color in this case. So there's your variables. You really do need to know the difference between independent variable, dependent variable, and controlled variables. So then I get this question a lot. Well, okay, I've got some data. What kind of graph should I use? Well, it depends on what kind of data you took. Notice in this example, the last example I used, I used a bar graph because I'm comparing categories, right? I had this category compared to this category and I put my error bars on it. That's not always the best type of graph. When you, for example, are trying to show a trend over time or temperature trend, you would use a line graph or maybe even a scatter graph. So that's when you have some values down here. Notice that I've got some numbers. So in this graph, what you see here is that I'm showing the grams of a certain chemical that are consumed over a period of time. Maybe this was, I was using an enzyme and I wanted to know how much of this chemical was consumed in a reaction over this time. So as the time went on, you can sort of see it started pretty steep, a lot of consumed, and then it kind of leveled off and didn't, and didn't consume as much then. So we've used a line graph here because we actually had some values down here that would help us plot this. Notice here I didn't have values for color. I had the white color, I had the red and blue color, so I needed to use a category or a bar graph to show those. So when you got some data and you're trying to decide, really think about what you're trying to convey. Am I really just showing a trend over time and I've got some values down here? Use a line or a bar graph. If you're really just comparing, uh, excuse me, a line or a scatter down here, if you're really just comparing some categories, use a bar graph. So um, I'm gonna end with this um, sort of discussion about why I think science is the best. I've just outlined how rigorous this process is, right? We do lots of things in science because science needs to be credible. Um, and words that I hear thrown around a lot that I wanna point out, I really just want to bring to your attention what they mean. So you might hear the word theory. Theory is something that is supported by a broad body of evidence. So if you've ever heard someone say, oh, that's just a theory. Well, they don't know what a theory means in science. In science, a theory means we have done a lot of research. We have a lot of evidence. There's a large body of evidence to support it. So examples of theory, the atomic theory, right? We still call it a theory because we have a large body of evidence to support it. If we get some new data that contradicts our atomic theory, as we did over many generations, then we change it. 
another prime example is our theory of gravity. So when we start to bring in other new um, theoretical physics ideas, right, then our theory of gravity might change a bit. But there is a large body of evidence to support it. And of course, evolution. There is a ton of evidence to support evolution by means of natural selection. So to say things like, oh, gravity is just a theory or evolution is just a theory, that's, that's not really the best way to say it because a theory has a ton of evidence. And if we found evidence that contradicted, of course, we would change the theory. Another reason why science is the best is because science is peer-reviewed. Meaning, when a scientist publishes work in a journal, it is peer-reviewed. So this helps us because a scientist will say, look at this study I did. I've got this groundbreaking idea. Well, then all the other experts, their peers in the field, will review that and give their comments before that is published. So this helps preserve the integrity of science because we're constantly checking, we're reviewing, we're looking at each other's work. And on the occasion where other scientists say, hey, there's some big holes in your logic here. There's some big flaws in this, right? An article might be redacted by the journal or it might not get published at all because there were some um, issues with the science. So science helps us understand the world around us. It helps us understand life, particularly in biology, because of this incredible amount of integrity and rigor that is attributed to the process. Hopefully, as we go through this year and you learn more about science, you'll keep that in mind, that these ideas and theories and laws that we're looking at are really supported by a broad body of evidence and by many, many experts in the field.